Hello and welcome to the Data Science and AI for the Creative Industries um, Highlights Package. Um, we're gonna, gonna get to see some students from the inaugural cohort of the program at the Creative Computing Institute um, talk about the research they did for their thesis, thesis projects. Each one of them will present a short video um, and I'll just do a quick introduction now. Um, there's so many cool projects over such a, like a wide variety of stuff. Um, it's going to be really exciting. Um, if you like what you see, um, you can check out some of the Open Day videos, which are also on this YouTube channel. Um, check out our website and um, get in contact with us. If you like some of the projects and you want to maybe speak to some of the students about it, I think probably the best thing to do is to go through them. Uh, go through us as well and we'll put you in contact. Um, so just uh, without any further ado, I'll just... Uh, introduce some of the projects. Um, so this was the first year we'd run this program. Um, and obviously there were some real challenges for this cohort kind of immediately coming into an ever worsening pandemic. Um, we probably ended up having about at least 50% of the classes online. Um, but they really overcame these challenges with such a great attitude to produce some really like amazing work and um, they were total rock stars. Um, it's worth considering that as a conversion masters, um, most of these students um, hadn't had much or maybe even no coding experience before, definitely no experience in machine learning or data science. Um, so to manage to get from there in September in just one year to go all the way through to making the quality of work that they did is an amazing achievement. They should all be super proud. Um, so I think really what just amazed us all was it's not just the quality of the work, but the interestingness of the projects, the depth of their critical reflection, um, the practical applications of this. These are all very like really relevant and practical projects. Um, the originality of some of the ideas and the solutions and the novel technical work and also in some cases the kind of academic standard of research findings and they're all great enjoy okay so um coming up is nadia's project um nadia did some really amazing work um i'd say what this is a great example of um, of the kind of stuff you can do if one, you do works that's of interest to you. So she took her kind of personal interests of her own background, her interest in fashion, um, saw a kind of a problem that existed and tried to use um, AI methods to solve this problem. Um, and she decided to take a quite pretty like original um, approach. So instead of trying to take on the like massive challenge of maybe analyzing images and trying to work out exactly what was going on there and what was modest and what wasn't, um, she decided to piggyback on um, the text descriptions um, and use some of the natural language programming skills she learned on the course. Um, it's a really interesting piece of original research and also really important as well. Hi, so my presentation is called Building a Modest Fashion Classifier, a template for teaching fashion aesthetics to AI. So this is a methodology for how fashion companies can use their own data to build a fashion classifier. Fashion data sets are you know, really hard to come by, quality ones at that. And so companies can use what they already own and make something custom tailored to them. So this uses a Gaussian naive based classifier and it predicts whether the description of a garment should be labeled as modest fashion. What I'm showing here is the pre-processing of text to build a set of features that relate specifically for modest fashion classification. So it's a template that can be used for any fashion aesthetic, but I personally want to shed light on the modest fashion industry because I feel that it's underrepresented. If you go to the ASOS website, they have a modest fashion edit and they claim to have anywhere between 100 and 200 options um, in that manual curation. So what I want to do is provide a much larger assortment of clothing for the modest fashion customer and to also automate this process. There's a gap between what the fashion industry needs and what um, fashion AI is researching. So this is a good example of a project where there is a need for something and this is the solution for tackling this problem. 
So background, we want to look at, does it exist for modest fashion? And does this exist for just fashion research in general? For modest fashion, no. There's no mention of modest fashion in AI research or fashion AI research. So when you look at all the fashion research, how much of this is actually being seen in retail? Not, you know, there's not a lot. Um, and I want to talk about this influence of computer vision for fashion and why specifically I'm not using it. When you think about how an image is being learned, if you want to calculate modest fashion, a you know, pretty reductionist approach would be to think, okay, well, if I calculate how much is skin and how much is fabric and I can find the ratio and put a threshold of how much skin is acceptable, but then, you know, you have exceptions. So this is an example of things that look okay from the front, but not from the back. And then things like styling. So in the first picture, the trousers on its own is fine, but if you put it in the whole image, that's going to be labeled as no. And then even if you want it to do an attention mechanism and focus just on one garment, you look at the shirt, that's also going to come out as no because it's been photographed in that way. Uh, so there's just so many exceptions and the sophistication of computer vision at this point is just not going to be enough for this kind of classification. So how did I do this? First, web scraping ASOS pages. So about just shy of 5,000 product pages was scraped and labeled yes or no manually. I labeled all of these manually. <laughs> I printed out the ranking of what are the top features for each class. And then I analyzed this, these feature words and that's how I improved the pre-processing step um, because I see what I want to be learned by the model and what I don't. So these are all the words that need to be learned as a unigram because they mean different things um, when you learn them separately. So for example, if we look at the design, lace up. Lace in the fashion context can mean various different things. Lace in terms of lace trimming, um, that's material or, you know, a hem detail versus lace up, which is this. They mean two different things, one, you know, more important than the other. And that's why words versus features are different things. And these are the ones that I found to be most relevant. And now after we've joined these together, what are the stop words that need to be removed? Um, and again, this is specific to the modest fashion context. So when we talk about color, why remove color? I mean, let's say any garment that's blue coincidentally is not, is not going to be labeled as modest fashion. Um, and so if that's all there is in the data set, the model is going to think that the color blue is a factor in something being modest fashion or not when it is. But then when we come to fabric, that's a bit more considered. The fabric used is can sometimes be um, necessary. So when we look at denim or the material denim um, doesn't play a role in something being modest fashion or not. That incidence, it's more of the length, the shorts versus the long jeans. That's what you want to learn here. But when you think about things like mesh, so this is a maxi dress, but it's completely see-through. You want to learn the word mesh because that makes a difference. So what do the feature words look like? Um, on one side, you have the before and the other is after pre-processing. Um, you can see in the before for the no class, the word black is being learned. So that's with ASOS uh, where, you know, just in this season, there are more black clothes that are not modest. And that's not something you want to learn because when you take that to next season, you know, that could, that could change. Um, when you think about changing trends, the model is not going to be sustainable. Um, if you learn patterns and language instead of actual attributes. We don't want to always look at the overall accuracy and error rate. Um, it's more important to look at things like precision recall. From there, I want to take it a step further and look at actually what's going in these numbers. So we look at the confusion matrix. So this is putting things into the perspective of the customer. So if you go on the ASUS website, uh, they have a scrolling feature. Um, but it shows 72 options at a time. What I wanted to do um, in my motivation was to provide more options. So you can see with the two models highlighted, um, 
you know, one of them gives 124 out of 1500 and the other one gives 179. But then what does this look like per page? So you get a 65 um, true positive compared to seven false positive ratio, which means when the customers on the ASOS website at every page, how many are going to be correct and how many are going to be, you know, noise. And that's how you think about where you set your sensitivity. You, you want to see something a bit more tangible. Now we look at the actual predictions in terms of the imagery. In general, the um, model performed pretty well. Uh, as you can see here, there's two trousers that are kind of similar looking, but one is see-through and the other one isn't. And so the model managed to recognize this and label the first one yes and the next one no. And just underneath you have the text about what um, what is the input that went in for this garment. So that's good. In general, it can recognize these things. The problem here is the false negative trade-off. In um, the ASOS collection, more maxi dresses and maxi skirts are not modest. And so it's been learned that way is a negative weight applied to no. These garments um, have all been labeled no when in reality two and four should have passed through. This just emphasizes how or the disproportion um, in the data set has such a big impact on, on how um, the features are being learned. Next are the limitations. So again, when you talk about annotations, all of these jumpsuits have to feature v-neck. Unfortunately, as you can see, they mean different things, or this kind of thing is more sensitive to the modest fashion consumer. The first and the third image are fine. The second and the fourth, the V-neck goes quite low, more like a plunge neck. But when you think about the text or what the model's reading, it's just seeing V-neck. And so when you've got two that are labeled yes and two labeled no with the same attributes, you know, that's confusing. That's where you get your false positives and your false negatives. With fashion, you can't just look at the numbers like in the um, evaluation metrics a 0.1 difference can make such a big deal when you amplify it into actual application in the retail world how the customer is going to look at it um, you have to look into what is going on next application to other styles and aesthetics idea process of how to build a fashion classifier can be applied to other things i've emphasized you know removing color from modest fashion because it's not important when you think about making a classifier for the goth aesthetic, you know, maybe you want the model to learn the difference between hot pink and black. Um, it's about knowing what's important to that aesthetic. And this is, is, is a template for how to do that. Um, next, keeping the customer in mind when researching fashion AI, like I said, um, have a more goal oriented um, objective. Think about what the customer needs um, how sensitive they are to um, the results of a, of a model should be considered more when researching fashion AI. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, Hadler. What I really love about this project um, <laughs> is that Hadler kind of found something that we didn't really touch on uh, that much in the actual course, which was kind of evolutionary approaches to computing. Um, but kind of having read around the subject and read a few papers, she immediately was like, I can see the application of this in graphic design, which was her background. Um, you know, I thought I really need to just like keep pulling this thread <laughs> um, kind of build some tools um, to see how we can kind of allow this uh, kind of interesting computational approach um, to provide interesting creative tools for graphic designers. And um, the tool that she's made is great. The images are really like engaging. Um, and like the, in, the original contribution of just like what kind of putting this hand into the, this tool into the hands of graphic designers and seeing what they uh, felt made the whole kind of thesis project really like rounded and uh, academically mature, which I really liked. Hello, my name is Hadlerberg. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation about my master thesis project in data science and AI for the creative industries. I have a degree in art history and a background in design, art and culture and advertising. While studying here at the UAL Creative Computing Institute, I became interested in interactive machine learning 
especially how it allows users' personal knowledge to be added to the outcome. Interactive evolutionary computation methods achieve exactly that by effectively evolving artifacts that are too subjective for the computer to evaluate itself, including artwork, music and design. I also find the initial creative process fascinating, how people go about finding inspiration and the tools they choose when framing ideas. I believe tools should be shaped by the people using them, as it offers a more diverse way of creating. All this inspired me to explore the use of interactive evolutionary computation in the creative process. So without further ado, let's take a look at my research. Through literature review, I discovered that using automation within a creative process is all about finding the correct balance between user control and computer automation. Interactive evolutionary computation allows this by combining their methods with user subjective evaluation or selection. One of the earlier users of interactive evolutionary computation was the digital media artist and software developer Carl Sims. In his installation Genetic Images, visitors could evolve abstract images interactively by standing on sensors in front of the image they selected. Drawing inspiration from Sims' work, among others, the online application Pitbreeder developed evolutionary exploration. That is, the goal is not to find a particular image, but all those of interest to the user. This allows new ideas to be discovered, whilst exploring a space of possible images that with each generation reflect more and more of the selection of the user. This is made possible with CPPN NEAT, an extension of neuroevolutionary algorithm that evolves artificial neural networks. Due to its abilities, I chose to use it for this research. Whilst evolutionary computation methods are a robust approach to helping users generate digital artifacts, results are often limited by user fatigue. Therefore, it is still unclear how to implement them effectively into the creative process. Addressing this gap, my aim was to develop a creative application that combines evolutionary images and traditional digital drawing tool to add to the knowledge of how interactive evolutionary computation can be used in the creative process. The application was developed from two existing code bases, one of a CPPN lead model and the other a traditional digital drawing tool. The emphasis was on the collaborative approach between the user and the model rather than the model's automation abilities, allowing user to retain some control of the outcome and adapt the model to their individual workflow. This flowchart shows the workflow of the model, including the three main operations, the selection, crossover and mutation. Let's take a look at the application at work. At the start of the evolutionary process, the model displays 25 images, the population, made from randomly arranged pixels. By double-clicking one of the images, it appears on the main canvas. The network for each image can be seen here on the right. Since the image selected has not been evolved, the network is simple. The output is three values for each pixel as a representation of the colors red, green and blue. To evolve an image, the user selects one to five images, parents, from the image collage. After choosing the images, the user generates a new generation by pushing the Evolve button. The Evolve process can continue as long as the user wants. The networks become more and more complex and sophisticated with each generation 
and more neurons with random activation functions are added. When the user sees an image they would like to work with, they can send it to the drawing board and use the brushes to add to the image as they see fit. To gain knowledge of how interactive evolutionary computation could be used in the creative process, I conducted a blend of interviews and observations. Creative practitioners were asked to trial the application and to use it as they saw fit while being observed. All participants were positive about their experience with the creative application. They found the application simple to navigate and control, however there was some difference in how they used it. All valued the option to control the creative process, but also found it inspiring to be presented with output that they would not have chosen to make themselves. One participant felt that the entertainment level of the application allowed the brain to believe that it wasn't doing work, and this was a good way to get inspir inspiration without any pressure. Another participant felt that the application expanded their ideas and ignited creativity. Another pointed out that the images would be perfect for working backgrounds and patterns and that working in collaboration with the application would force them out of their usual comfort zone. All participants were able to foresee the application being incorporated into the creative workflow with some changes though. All participants gave feedback that would be useful to improve the application, including various modification of the application's interface and functions, things like being able to slightly adjust the image manually and work on the couple of images at the same time. Future work include modifying the application as participants suggested and test it again with a larger, more diverse group of participants. Further research is needed into designing the application interface in order to reduce user fatigue, as well as into a system which allows people's non-digital work to be incorporated with the images that are being evolved. The main focus of this research was to explore the use of an interactive evolutionary computation in the creative process. Answering the first research question, it is necessary to improve the interactive aspect within the application in order for the user to be able to incorporate it into their individual workflow, as well as reduce user fatigue. In regards to the second question, then it is necessary to offer more diverse user options within the application rather than just empathizing on automation of the model's evolutionary abilities. Continuing research would be beneficial, as would further development of the application. Thank you for listening, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, okay, Charmaine. Um, I remember the first time that Charmaine came to me and she was like, Louis, I want to hide messages in pictures. And we kind of sat down and thought, right, how are we going to do this? And um, she kind of had this like very clear goal from the beginning um, and then really managed to um, totally deliver on it. Um, but really impressed with how she overcame some pretty like hard technical challenges and, and also like uh, the thesis and the kind of the work in general um, showed that she really had quite a, d a deep understanding of how these models work um, and how to kind of, how you might kind of go about quite methodically taking an original idea um, and kind of technically making something that really worked. Great work, Charmaine. Hello, I'm presenting my thesis project. In this project, I experiment with audio to image encoding by use of neural network. The presentation will be in the following orders. First, I will talk about the research questions. Then I will describe some of the background research. Then I will talk about the technical development process, followed by evaluation, and finally some key findings. 
The project idea was inspired by the structure of autoencoder. I wonder if that structure can be applied to cross-domain as well. Now take a look at the proposed mechanism. First, I will train an audio autoencoder. This encoder will take the audio as input, convert it into latent factor, and output the reconstructed audio. In order to encode the audio into image, I will substitute the audio decoder with an image decoder. In this way, the audio can be encoded into an image. And this process is supposed to be reversible. By putting this image through the reverse structure, the audio can be reconstructed. And in this operation, the latent factor is very important. When this latent factor, which is restored from the image, is the same as the input latent vector, the image to audio conversion should be possible. In order to measure success, there are two goals. Primary goal was to prove that latent vector can be a bridge for cross-domain conversion. Secondary goal was to reconstruct audio message with desirable quality. Now let's look at the background research. They are in three areas, namely image generation, audio generation, and cross-domain conversion. For image generation, machines can now generate very realistic images. I include an example of style transfer because I think it's very intriguing. It transfers style from one image to another. The next example is creative GANs. The researchers wanted to make GANs creative, so it pushes to generate new style painting, and the resulting painting are indistinguishable from human painting. Similar to image generation, machines can now generate very realistic speech. I include WaveGAN as an example here. It's aimed to deal with waveform signal instead of cetrogram to reduce loss. It works by basically changing the 2D convolution to 1D so that it can generate waveform directly. Lastly, we can look at cross-domain conversion. This example is quite functional. It takes audio input and converts it into semantically relevant image. For example, the sound of speedboat will generate image of speedboat. Now let's look at the technical development process. There are two things to evaluate during the development process. First, I would like to know if the audio reconstructed from the image is the same as that reconstructed from the sole audio part. Second, I would like to check the reconstruction quality of the audio. It is mainly responsible by the audio model. There are four iterations of models. The first one was created with variational autoencoder only. I trained it with spoken digits dataset with male voice only. Here you can see a sample of the encode image. It's quite blurry. And I've prepared some audios for demonstration. Let's listen to the original audio first. Sugar. It's the word sugar. Now let's listen to the reconstructed one. <laughs> it's of quite bad quality. Um, but it's explainable because the data set consists of only digits, so the model is not good at reconstructing other words. Um, however, the reconstruction from image was quite good. It's quite similar to the sole audio output. Now let's look at the second model. This model keeps the same structure as the previous one but I train it with spoken sentence dataset with male and female voice instead of digit dataset. The reconstruction result was better. Let's listen to it first. Sugar. It's more interpretable. However, the reconstruction from image was bad. Let's listen to it. Sugar. It's very different from the sole audio output we just heard. Other than this, there is another problem. The model works poorly with complex audio. Let's listen to the original audio first. Let me see. Now listen to the reconstructed one. Let me see. It's similar, but it's not interpretable. 
for the third model, I mainly want to deal with the image reconstruction problem. So I substitute the image VAE with image GANs, but the audio VAE was kept the same. Here you can see that with GANs, the output image is less blurry. And one thing to highlight is the reconstruction quality from image is perfect. It is same as the slow audio output. Therefore, GANs perform better than VAE for the image model. For the fourth model, I tried using audio GANs instead of audio VAE. I used pre-trained model of wave GAN, which was trained with spoken digit. Now let's listen to some sample. Now I, I will play the original first. Two. Now the reconstructor one. The quality was not good. It's very ambiguous. So uh, this is not a good model either. Now let's look at the evaluation session. I will focus on the third model because it's relatively better. From the experiment, I can conclude that my primary goal was bad. That is, the audio reconstructed from image can be the same as that reconstructed from the sole audio part. That also means cross-domain conversion by use of latent factor is possible. However, the reconstruction quality was bad. I shared the reconstruct message to six people for evaluation. I asked them to interpret the message. The result was very bad. For English, its accuracy was only 38%. For Cantonese, it is 30%. However, it is quite interesting that the model can reconstruct Cantonese message, provided that it was only trained with English dataset. Regarding the failure of audio reconstruction, I think the possible cause is the VAE blurry output. Here you can see that the spectrogram of reconstructed audio is very blurry when compared to the original audio. But why the audio GANs also didn't work? I believe there are three reasons. Firstly, the pre-trained model were not designed for the reconstruction purpose. Secondly, Wave GANs doesn't perform well with speech. It was designed for music or sound effect generation. Thirdly, many of the state-of-the-art speech generation model use male spectrogram to condition the GANs. It's different from wave GANs. Now, let's look at some key findings. As you can see, there are two groups of images. One are generated from audio. The other were randomly generated. Those generated from audio look quite similar, and they seem to have some pattern. I suspect by just looking at the images, we can have some idea about the hidden message. For example, these two images were generated with the same word spoken by two different speakers. You can see the color tone of two images were quite similar, and this part of the image were also similar. Finally, I want to share some ways to improve performance of the model. Firstly, we should use larger dataset containing different phonemes and voices. Secondly, we should increase latent dimension for a complex dataset because generation of latent factor is a compression process. We should not make the compression rate too high. Lastly, many state-of-the-art vocoder use conditional GANs. This could be a direction for future development of the model. That's the end. Thank you. Okay, OT. <laughs> I mean, as we're really great with like a large number of these projects, um, we've got people who are doing work as master's thesis, um, but conducting work either by itself or maybe just as like a first step towards original research. Um, it's kind of, you know, if, if, they, if they continued on working on it, um, these are definitely like looking at things that are potentially publishable. The ATs was one of these theses. Um, uh, it really battled against um, technical resource challenges um, in terms of like how he'd collect all the data and run all these WhatsApp simulations. Um, and also in collecting data in a way that WhatsApp really didn't want him to, he kind of really had to like hack against their privacy controls, which I guess is kind of one of the interesting things about the project. And I think also he mentioned that maybe this um, kind of loophole that he was using is now being closed by WhatsApp. So kind of an interesting piece in, in, in of itself. Um, 
and kind of with all that hard work he ended up with some really interesting results. Oh, hello. Hi. I'm sorry, I was distracted by my WhatsApp messages. I don't know, it's a weird habit that I've picked up over time that I keep checking my cell phone. I just keep opening WhatsApp even though I don't have notifications and scrolling up and down through different charts and after it, after a certain period of time, I just take it out of my pocket and check it. But is it just me or is this all of us? And is it just WhatsApp? Because I also do that for social media platforms such as Facebook. And I think it's it's that these mobile devices, these devices have become so intertwined in our lives that we just can't seem to get rid of them. They're involved in everyday processes and it's become a behavioral trait, which means that a majority of the time that we also spend is on these devices. And there are a lot of subconscious patterns that we are leaving behind. And if they were to collect it, they could maybe tell very interesting stories about us. Do you ever get the feeling that Facebook is listening to us? Because I do. I start, we start seeing these ad words that seem like, like these were the things we're talking about or these are the things we're thinking about, but then we are also seeing them. And it makes us wonder, is Facebook actually listening to us? How does Facebook know what our thoughts are? And that, that is what our targeted advertisements are, these personalized advertisements. But what they do is they take our behavioral data and then feed us the content on what they think we would like based on our behavior. But the real question is, are we really that predictable? Because that's what data scientists are doing these days. They are able to make these sort of predictions and predict what sort of people will behave in what manner. But is, is our behavior really such a strong identifier of who we are or what we are going to do? or the type of things we might pick? Well, this brings us to digital behavioral patterns and apparently we keep seeing these things where uh, stores can figure out which one of their customers, by looking at their buying history, they can figure out which one of their customers are likely pregnant and then target them with products that you would usually buy during a pregnancy or families would buy. And it, it makes us think, wow, so my behavioral patterns that I'm leaving subconsciously, they say so much about me, which is quite sort of remarkable. But we've also seen things like the fact that this data, like our data is also being used to sway public discourse uh, or influencers or influence our, uh, influence elections by doing something that is also referred to as the engineering of consent, by changing our perceptions on who, who we should vote for. Apparently this Cambridge Analytica scandal was a very famous thing where Facebook data was scraped from millions of profiles to build uh, psychological profiles for those individuals and then use that to target people, to target advertisements in the hope of swaying the, who they might vote for surprising but the availability of these large-scale data sets and the advances in computational processing power has opened the door to a whole new world of possibilities especially in the field of behavioral sciences so quincy and still will have demonstrated to us that by access to an individual's digital records such as likes from the social media platform facebook they are able to predict personality traits for those individuals to a very high degree of accuracy Similarly, Quersa uh, and researchers have demonstrated similar findings for other social media platforms such as Twitter. And in some cases, they've also demonstrated that these predictive models are shown to be more accurate in comparison to those made by uh, the friends uh, of those individuals uh, because we would think that our friends might understand us better than a model. But apparently these models, our behaviors are better predictors of our personality than, let's say, our friend, someone that knows us. Which brings us to the question of the thesis, uh, of what this thesis explores, which is investigating whether patterns of online and offline behavior are indicative of any particular personality trait. And for this research, we are focused on WhatsApp, even though uh, a multitude of uh, platforms such as uh, instant messaging platforms such as WhatsApp, Telegram, Line, WeChat exist. 
but we are focused on WhatsApp because it's the most popular instant messaging application, which by far has the largest user base. Another reason why we're focusing on instant messaging platforms, we've seen a lot of research been done on social media platforms and other platforms uh, showcase that this is indeed possible. But nowadays, uh, instant messaging services have also started to resemble social media platforms through the introduction of features start, such as stories, statuses, and other features that they're introducing, which makes one think, is it possible that our online behavior on an instant messaging service such as WhatsApp could be predictive of a certain personality trait? But before we even talk about the experiment or whether we can do that or not, we need to understand why personality traits why are personality traits important what would happen if we could predict them what is their significance and personality traits have shown to influence our cognitions emotions and other everyday real world behaviors in various situations uh Nunes and who explained that similar people with similar personality traits are also likely to have similar interests and preferences so if you can figure out uh basically different people uh uh, with different personalities and what their likes and dislikes are then and if you were also able to predict what other people's personality is then you can target them with with the, the same likes and dislikes and that way you you'll get that is what targeted marketing also sort of is but so for this experiment we sort of use this this idea of the five factor model uh five factor is a way to determine our personality traits al along five different per, uh, traits uh, it was a model that was developed by Costa and McRae and is a widely accepted theory in psychology research. Uh, Cobb and Clark, uh, Cobb, Clark and Schroer explained that one of the reasons for the popularity of this model over other behavioral science models or personality models is that these, these five categories are unlikely to experience ordinal changes over time. Uh, H. Reese has further described the five-factor model as the most scientifically rigorous taxonomy that behavioral science has. It has five categories, which is uh, openness, which varies from cautious, consistent to curious and inventive, uh, conscientiousness, which varies from careless, easygoing to organized and efficient, extroversion, which varies from solidarity or reserve to someone outgoing or energetic, agreeableness, uh, which focuses from cold or unkind to friendly and compassionate or neuroticism which varies from secure and calm to unconfident and nervous so the effect of these personality traits like let's let's look at what they could mean so uh, research has shown uh, for example uh, has demonstrated that the effect of big five personality traits are uh, they have an effect on friendship selection uh, personality traits have also shown to have correlation with many aspects of romantic relationships such as partner choice and the level of attachment. Uh, research has also shown correlation between personality dimensions and job performance. Personality has also shown to influence an individual's part, political orientation or political leanings who you're more likely to work for. So that's those are the impacts of personality and then then research also shows us that it is actually possible to use our digital behavior to predict personality for individuals uh, just by using their digital behavior for example uh, Sa satchel demonstrate by using information obtained from sensors and logs about individuals everyday smartphone behavior it is possible to infer their big five personality dimensions or uh, by uh, another research demonstrates that by collecting online micro blogging behavior on the platform Sina Weibo, which is very similar to Twitter, uh, which is the Chinese version of Twitter, they demonstrate that it is possible to precisely predict active user score on each personality category. But then there's also things like uh, using public data from Facebook profiles, uh, Globac Robles, uh, and Turner also demonstrated that it is indeed possible to build. Uh, a model and predict personality of each of the five personality factors within 11% of the actual values of individuals. Uh, th this again brings us to this idea of targeting or psychological targeting and uh, re literature also show demonstrates that the application of psychological targeting makes it possible to influence the behavior of people, uh, of large groups of people through the use of psychological tailored psychological appeals based on personality of the target audience. Uh, there's further research that's also been conducted to examine whether the persuasive appeals affect uh, uh, 
Persuasive appeals effectiveness can be increased by matching or framing of the message to the recipient's personality profile and showed that it indeed does. So for the purpose of this experiment, since we were focused on WhatsApp and trying to understand if WhatsApp behavior can be a predictor, uh, if our personalities uh, and WhatsApp behaviors have a correlation and whether that behavior, uh, whether if that behavior was recorded over time, uh, if we were able to model a relationship between uh, our behavior and any particular personality trait. So we started by recruiting the participants. Uh, the participants for the study were recruited from various university notice boards and through the word of mouth among friends and family members uh, and through their family members uh, on the notice board. They were also based in one geographic location, which was Pakistan, as the intent of this research was to report findings from a third world country. The survey collected the first name, last name, A, sex, mobile number with an active WhatsApp account because that's what the, that's the one of the reasons why we were collecting the phone number so we can monitor those accounts. Uh, occupation, geographic location of the participants after they uh, gave all of those details. Uh, they were presented with a short 15 item big five inventory questionnaire after filling in the questionnaire they were shown their final score for each of the big five category and presented with a unique identifier which can be tied to their youth data and also that would help in the anonymization process the research in total had 30 participants uh, the research relied on exploiting a feature of WhatsApp, which is the activity status of a user and can also be viewed as a privacy flaw. Uh, this uh, feature is flawed from a privacy point of view due to the fact that as long as someone has a contact in their address book with an active WhatsApp account, they can open a new chart with them and view if the contact is online. And every time any participant comes online, their activity status is logged as online. Uh, with the corresponding date and timestamp. Similarly, when their online status disappears, that is logged as offline with the corresponding date and uh, timestamp. And that also allows us to generate a new feature called duration between the online and offline. That way we can figure out how long they were online for uh, uh, in a certain instance. So we, are, we collected the data, we started analyzing it. So for example, the first column from the left shows us the distribution of age against the scores of the big five categories. And looking at the graph, it's evident that the majority of the values across all of the big five dimensions that we have, uh, like the values that we've obtained within our study are between the age for, our, for the ages of 20 to 30 years of age. Uh, then the second column from the left also shows us that the distribution, uh, shows us the distribution of sex against the five categories it is visible that females uh, in our study uh, exhibit slightly higher neuroticism scores as compared to males and this behavior has also been validated by another research uh, by another research finding and is evident that uh, in in the in, in our data said despite its small sample size of 30 people uh, we also evaluated our data in terms of the skew, uh, the skewness in the data and age uh, uh, for age, the data was highly skewed. Openness, the data was highly skewed. Conscientiousness uh, was moderately skewed. Extroversion was highly skewed. Agreeableness was moderately skewed. And neuroticism was again highly skewed. This brings us to the idea that we were trying to create correlations and based on the initial data explanation that we just looked at, it was evident that the data within our data set were, was skewed and didn't conform to a normal distribution as a result to better understand the relationship between the big five scores and other features within the data frame, a Spearman rank correlation coefficient was calculated between all the features. Uh, the reason uh, this test was used was it's designed for non-parametric data, the, the skewed data, uh, as opposed to uh, Pearson's correlation. Uh, the figure showcases the heat map, which is based on the size of the correlation between the features. And the strongest correlations that can be observed are within uh, conscientiousness and with, uh, conscientiousness and duration. This further demonstrates that there is a likely relationship between the two. So we move forward in terms of trying to model them. The problem that we had was that our data set was small, especially if we start to generate like average sleep and things like that, like the amount of values we had were very small. So uh, the small data set meant that if the data were split further into a train and test split, it would reduce the size of the training samples for the model. So as a possible solution, we tried cross validation, which opted uh, for a uh, random, for random regression model. Uh, the technique ent entailed building different models so that predictions can be made on all the data. Uh, at each instant, the prediction is made by a model uh, on the data on the example that it hasn't uh, seen before. 
Uh, the models were built by taking into account A, sex, average duration, average frequency as input features, while conscientiousness was fed as the output feature. The only reason that whole technique was done was so that we can train on the entire model because we had a very small set. Uh, and evaluating the results of each model, which we can also see on the right, we can see that the mean absolute percentage error were huge between every model. and uh, three out of five of these models uh, also had a negative R2 value, which also implies that the model, model does not follow the trend of the data and fits worse than a horizontal line. So clearly that wasn't usable. We move towards a technique uh, uh, which is LSTM, uh, where instead of using our feature generation because we were throwing away a lot of timestamps that we have to condense them into these features of like averages and stuff what we did was between every online and offline timestamp we generated a new feature which was called duration uh using that we generated uh thousands of uh, uh features because we had so many timestamps and then what we created were window sizes so uh, a window of your 50 last 50 durations and the personality score it corresponds to so we had multiple uh, uh, rows and uh, multiple windows and each window was the size of 50 last known durations and the corresponding conscious conscientiousness value uh, so that allowed us to for greatly increase our data set uh, the best size although we tried many different uh, variants of best size learning rate and other things uh, but the thing that worked best for us for us was uh, the best size of 64 the learning rate of 0 0.01 uh, this allowed us to actually build a model uh, with a validation mean squared error of 4 points uh, 4, 0 0.45 which if you divide 0 0.45 by 7 into 100 to get a, like a percentage of the mean squared error it would be roughly 6.5 percent so by an error of 6.5 percent uh within the values uh, which is much significantly uh, better than let's say 11 percent of what research from social media data was showing we also saw the mean absolute error of 0 0.1789 or the mean absolute percentage error was 4%. Obviously, we do uh, also understand at this point that in order to accurately determine the accuracy of this model, it would have to be tested on uh, further uh, participants, like newer data from uh, other participants would have to be gathered. And uh, then we would have to compare to actually determine how accurate it is. But from the results of the validation set, the validation set is the test that the model had not seen these were some of the findings uh, which is quite remarkable so the key findings of our research were uh, we provided an evidence for the strong correlation of online and offline behavior with at least one big five personality traits which is conscious conscientiousness we showcase that it is indeed possible to model the relationship between users online uh, uh, between the users online behavior and their conscientiousness score to create a predictive model with a very high degree of accuracy we further validated that indeed our personal personalities do affect our online behavior. We also highlighted how the activity data from instant messaging platform can be weaponized by companies or advertisers and have grave privacy implications. Uh, the potential privacy or ethical uh, uh, implication, and uh, I'll just give an example of uh, how that can be done. So research demonstrates, for example, that significant correlation between conscientiousness and job, uh, there is a significant correlation between uh, conscientiousness and job performance. So let's say an employer were able to predict your conscientiousness score to a high degree of accuracy using the public data from WhatsApp because you already make job applications and you put your phone number in there. That alone could alone uh, could impact their decision on whether to hire you or not in comparison to other candidates, and that could be taken up into account into, in terms of filtering process. Similarly, advertisements and other marketing content can also be targeted to individuals based on this uh, singular personality trait, thus feeding a narrative that the individual uh, might be more open to and exploiting them in the process. As we've seen, uh, uh, that literature has demonstrated that this sort of content is indeed uh, uh, quite effective and yeah that's everything uh, thank you so much uh, and there's a small message from Mark Zuckerberg for us thank you take care okay fabs 
this is probably more than any other thing. Obviously, everything we do kind of sits on this intersection of creativity and creative industries and like uh, coding and AI and data science and stuff. Um, Fabs's project is probably the best example um, of how we can use art and music and technology as a conduit for science communication. Um, so Fabs came in as a practicing artist and ended up contending with some pretty serious maths um, and working on like a pretty a nice real world collaboration with some actual like biomedical scientists. Um, a lovely bit of work. So for my project, I created a program which transformed protein structure into sound. Is uh, hosted on, in a collab notebook, and basically what it does is, uh, given a set of protein, it is able to transform them to sound using a modulation of their geometrical feature. So if you are not familiar with collab, basically you simply run this notebook, and what's happen? It will work for you. As you can see here, you have different protein ID. You can decide whatever protein ID you want, and uh, you just press play on the left corner. And basically here you can see the structure of your protein, and uh, you can you know extract further you know um, information like further distance and max width. And doing so, you calculate then more important feature like the volume of the convex tool, the further distance, the rotating caliper, and the centroid of your protein, and then you translate all the protein. Then you add them all together in a combinational wave, which will sound like this. At this point, we offer further, you know, information and a way to create sounds of protein using different techniques, uh, such as a proof of work. I dem uh, we demonstrate in my thesis that it is possible to do with fast Fourier transformation, and have something that will look like this and will indeed look like, uh, sounds like this. This is a more example. So the, yeah, and then we have a different, you know, way to do so, adding further characteristic to the way with an approach of called higher frequency approach. Here you can see the all the code. See? And it will sound slightly different and shorter. So why this was done was to create a system of fur cones that you know that work with every given protein and potentially every given 3D structure and it was quite fun working this project because I had the opportunity to collaborate with different scientists and uh, have a project that you know try to fill the gap between scientific approach and scientific discipline like you know biology and the creative practice like music Okay, Paolo, um, what an innovative way um, to use really state-of-the-art approaches and um, the clip language model that Paolo uses in this project wasn't publicly available when the course started. Like this was something that was kind of released kind of a couple of months probably before he started the project and immediately was taken and involved into the thesis research. So really working on the cutting edge. Um, it's such an innovative way to engage with um, museum collections. Um, I know for a fact that uh, there are people in digital teams that like art galleries and museums at the moment currently working on ways that they've got all of this kind of digital content um, relate, that relates to their collection and finding interesting ways to both engage with people with it online um, and kind of 
just ways to explore this stuff that they can't put on the walls because they've only got limited space. Um, and like Polo's work totally sits within this. Um, and it's a lovely mix of like practical use and a kind of playful, fun interaction. Hi, my name is Polo Solokov and welcome to my thesis project, which is uh, for which I made a clip-driven visual search tool for digital museum collections. So let me talk you through my motivations and background first. So I come from a graphic design background and during my studies, I wanted to enter the Met because I like to go to museum collections to get inspired. Um, and while I like going to those, I find them quite overwhelming that big. There's so much choice. You don't really know where to start. Um, so I gave myself a task. I wanted to find every single book of a um, museum. So I went there and took pictures of every single one of them. And being a design student, obviously I had to make a design outcome. And because I was interested in how to share it in the world and I can also arrange it in different ways, what the way I can like show it to the world. Um, so I enjoyed that. I could give myself this entry point to a collection and then also think about how to have other people interact with it. Um, and yeah, this is something I want to explore further in ways that I can do at scale, not all manual. So I thought through AI, you can really do that more and also do it in, in ways that maybe are like just more relevant um, today um, because there's so many collections, especially on the internet. And I feel like there's a lot of room for innovation, which is how I ended up at CCI. Um, and then through my studies, I realized that I'm not the only one interested in that, which is great. So it is actually like a thing <laughs> that uh, museums are very interested in AI, AI and there's a lot of prototypes that explore how to make interesting interactive interfaces uh, for people to interact with the like increasingly digitized museum collections. Um, and yeah, just kind of find more ways to explore things um, using AI. So I wanted to make my own contribution to that uh, and make an AI-driven interface for casual users, people who are just interested to in going to the museum in their free time um, to search the collections um, online um, and do it like in a playful and fun way that brings out unexpected maybe um, results that can be inspiring um, and just maybe think of make you think in different ways, which is sort of what is defined by serendipity. Uh, and then also allow for critical engagement with AI, make it more visible, show like the backgrounds of it and see how it can like maybe work in good or bad ways, you know? Um, so what I made, let me show you. Um, this is like a quick little demo. So basically I made a drawing by searching tool and you can also upload pictures. So um, yeah, you can search free collection of this at the same time, the Cooper Hewitt, um, the Met and Science Museum. And then um, you get the top match. Um, and then at the bottom you can see sort of the technological background, like how the match was generated. So at the bottom you see sort of AI predicted terms that basically define the matches, which I will explain in a sec. Um, so yeah, this is the result. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk you through the process, um, for which I've made a system, data collection, and the interface. And for the system, um, uh, it is a content-based image retrieval system, meaning that you put in an image um, and get a matching image or like more images. Um, so you don't tend to like um, compare the images like pixel by pixel, you turn them into like a different representation um, to compare like the numbers. Um, so you can maybe 
do it. Some people, some systems like use this, like maybe compare things like shape or like color. In my case, I, I chose to um, compare the images by the predicted tags they get, each of them, um, using a different AI system to generate those predicted tags. And um, these tags are uh, specific to the museums. Um, so if you look at the system over, over here now, um, in the interface, there's three systems uh, separate for each museum. So um, the tags you see are sort of like official museum tags or taxonomy terms that I could get. Um, so just like a list of words. So the representations are not those top five words. They're actually the whole list of words but uh, the probabilities um, of each word, uh, like which one is the most likely one. Um, so that kind of shows like the whole variety of things in the context. Um, so yeah, this is how the system works. And the AI um, used to generate those t uh, tags is called clip. It is quite new. It was released last year and it became viral because it looks so great um, um, but it was like trained on like a huge amount of images uh, and description pairs and it was trained to predict visual concepts um, so the good thing is that it works quite well generally and it's also it's a zero shot classifier so you don't need to train the model which is something that takes up a lot of time especially with like the collection so um, you can just like put in a list of words and images and then um, that's it really. So it is great for prototyping and trying out things using different collections. Um, and here you can see like this part um, is basically what is used in that feature extraction list. That's the AI model. Um, yeah. So the data for the data collections, I chose those three museums because they kind of all have, it's a bit different. You can kind of see the contrast. I was, I was curious to see um, how the system will work for them and uh, maybe also just show a way for people to be able to just directly compare collection, uh, collections with each other, uh, make, the, make them accessible in this way. So the Science Museum obviously is science-based, microfree with, with more design-based and the Met is more art-based. And I, I collected the stuff through their public APIs. Um, so this is a way of makes it quite accessible to scrape museum data, uh, specifically the stuff that's like freely available under the Creative Zero Commons domain license thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, uh, they had to have like tags available or like some kind of taxonomy terms. Um, so that was kind of criteria for me. Um, and then, oh, let me show you just the system. So yeah, let me just show you <laughs> the interface again, just to um, connect the dots. So yeah, you can draw some things and then you get the first match. Uh, and then here at the bottom, you see the tags just the top five ones, but that was kind of designed as a way for people to be able to just kind of compare it against each other and see just reason like, hmm, like, how does the AI work? Like, why did I get to a, a specific conclusion? Because sometimes maybe it's not like completely obvious or like, or maybe it can like show like some more things. And then also you can see that, um, again, for the input image, they're always different. So I want to see and also show how um, that, the background workings are not just the AI, but also the kind of structure of the museums, the, the words they use. Um, so that's something. And then I also, here you can see the artworks um, in the actual collection site. So that allows for more exploration um, and credits, obviously. So yeah. Upload a picture, you get these sort of results. Um, and yeah, so my hope was that you can just kind of just like keep exploring really. Keep 
like that, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah. So see, it's 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 always like you never know, really know what's gonna come up. Um, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, I was just gonna talk about some of like the evaluation I did. Um, so in the end, I evaluated sort of the system and um, not like on accuracy, but the sort of results it came up came up with and what I could say about um, sort of the choices that were made <laughs> and also like the AI system of Lab itself and also the collection. Um, so, yeah, so it, the system depends on basically what is recognized by Clip in both the query images and the medium uh, objects. So it can really vary, like for like, especially for sketches um, that, that can be more abstract. And then um, it depends on what words it has to describe what it sees. So, um, which is basically the tag that I was given. Um, and then what is uh, available in the collections, um, which again are also just small subsets of the overall medium collections. So I, I wasn't able to obviously get the whole entire collection. Um, so basically this clip like learned the thing of like a big, big uh, collection of things. And then it's given certain limitations really that are historically shaped. So you've got, again, just to show you how, like, this is like a small subset of like the tags, obviously, but it shows just like how different the languages are. Um, and then also here, it says it's how like, it looks like each collection is pretty big with like up to like 40,000 like uh, objects. It's still like such a small part of the overall collection. And then the vocabulary, it's um, varies, it is, made very differently in each uh, uh, museum and it's also not always complete like it's really just like how i was able to get it also through using the api so like there were just like limitations along each step and they really end up just shaping the whole experience um and then the way that clip described the image in this context was shaped by Basically, it was trained on how people describe images on the internet. Uh, it's a huge, huge, huge collection. It, it, it's everything on the internet, and you can think of like all the things that people think and say on the internet. So it's all those things that it has learned. And then it's also shaped by how museum professionals describe objects in their collections. So um, that's historically shaped over hundreds of years, you know. Um, and then it's also influenced by how I built the system, what are like the decisions I made and like uh, the data that I chose, uh, how I used the system. Um, all of this has an impact. Um, it is so historically shaped, it's biased, um, it's limited, and all the approaches along these steps, they're so varied. Um, there's so many individual things, people, bots, but yeah. Um, I just want to show some examples. Uh, so they can also correlate with the things that were also written in the original clip paper, which um, uh, is that basically the model is really good at like um, recognizing general objects. So that again works really well in this museum context because uh, if you draw like a vase, there's probably going to be a lot of vases, which that's how it works with bulbs. So that works really well. So furniture stuff like that um it, it looks it, how it makes sense and it looks useful um and then here like with animals for instance like overall like obviously it makes sense but then like um as it was said in clip like it's not always like so great at making super like fine great uh decisions so maybe you won't really be able to find out like a very specific like animal. So like maybe someone draws a goose, but you won't necessarily get geese, um, you know. So, but you get like, you get animals of the type, you get, you get birds, you get like uh, dogs, uh, if you're lucky. So it, it works for like this general thing and that, that could be enjoyable. 
Uh, and then what I really liked and was kind of hoping for is that maybe you don't really get like an exact representation. You kind of get like something that was maybe sort of misrecognized um, and which kind of like maybe get these like little like surprises that I was hoping for um, that really also connect to like the art of in shonen museums. So you maybe have like you draw a butterfly you get uh, an artwork that isn't exactly butterflies, but you can maybe see how it it could be like uh, like it kind of makes sense from the shape or the colors, and that kind of allows for these kind of like abstract connections, which seem to be quite nice, which you can't really maybe get like through like keyword search. Um, and then what I love was um, that you get these. Um, really semantic connections um, because you don't really get like the exact shape of something or like even like the same thing maybe you don't get a sun but you kind of get something that's an answer to it so like a tool is, that's given to you and it happens quite a lot so you get sunglasses for a sun or keys for a car uh, bamboo for a bear so or panda really so uh, that happens a lot and i think that's very interesting um and then again like that makes it kind of possible to also get responses for things that might not be like in a historic collection. You you maybe like draw a console, but you get buttons in return because maybe at the Cooper Weaver doesn't have a switch, but like it will have buttons for sure. So it's nice that you can see these connections where like, you know, it's very interesting to me. <laughs> and again here, uh, you get what you what the museum has. The Science Museum might not have so many paintings. Somehow it has Maybe it's a coconut, maybe it's not, but it does look like it. Um, and here you get, you can see how Cooper Hewitt could get like, really like, you could get the exact same thing that was shown in the image, um, which you see like that there's a potential on that. But then if not, you resort to other things like a photograph, not maybe the bridge. Um, and then I was looking at um, also, um, how it works with like images of people. This is an image of me, and I was obviously uh, worried with how like it could turn out because of those biases and how um, there is a certain risk. Uh, so here you can see it seems to be working fine, but again, like you you see the specific things. I mean, it has uh, give me like gender kind of things. It calls me bald uh 13 percent bold but then yeah so this is what you get but then like if you see here here things that maybe are like more problematic and i kind of like show how it can go wrong or like be like at least like you know not great a great experience for users um, um so here you can often see that the results don't really look so bad but then like you if you look at the tags you can maybe get things that are sort of like racialized, gendered, um, weird, you know, like the Science Museum, for instance, like uh, I think mental health is a tag or something. Um, and then also, yeah, or like with the result, like you get like a toothpick for a person. It's maybe not what you really want to see or if you put like a picture of yourself in there. Um, and then it kind of like really makes it also think like uh, what kind of results do you get for different sorts of people, uh, populations? Um, so yeah, this is uh, also those sort of risks. Also, it also shows like, obviously it's influenced by the words that the uh, uh, museum collection have, um, and which could be not great or outdated. Um, or here you, you just really get that, you see those opinions really turn up in the collection in this case, I think it's quite funny. It can be also not. It is again surprising, which I was hoping for. So this is this is it. Um, I did a user study. I don't have time for that. It's already twenty minutes long. Um, future work. Um, I would love to make more of the interface, get more matches and overviews, and like explanations of the AI system itself. So you could can actually have that critical engagement of it. Um, and then do more user testing because even though I didn't talk about it, it was quite interesting. And then I would like put it online. And 
here are some references for the things I've mentioned um, and the works I've mentioned are great. And yeah, uh, on the project repo, you can see the code and you can also run it locally um, and my contact details. That's it. Thank you. Bye. Okay, and we're done. I'd just like to thank all of the students first and foremost for taking the time to make those videos for us and also for just doing the work in general. What a talented bunch they are. We've seen music, we've seen art, we've seen social science, um, fashion analysis, secret messages hidden in paintings. Amazing. Thank you all for watching and taking the time out to check out these projects. And thanks to all the CCI team for putting this stuff together. Um, this will be on YouTube for the foreseeable future, along with loads of other great stuff on the CCI channel. Check out the UAL graduate showcase page for the data science course. So this is where hopefully there'll be more links to these projects and contact details for the students. Check out the course site for the data science course if you want to apply and get in touch contact with me. Or if you're an industry person, get in touch with us. If you want to work with our students, we've got loads of great knowledge exchange stuff as well. Um, thank you very much. Cheers.